my father would take a knife and he would purse himself, no blood, no bruise, and he can play with the deadly snakes. I grew up in the village of Garagama in Ethiopia. My father had 21 wives and 64 children. Christians were being hunted and killed in my country at that time. Eventually, I went to Canada, but I could not be happy knowing that my family and friends were still serving spirits. I had to return to tell my father about Jesus. I simply came to see my father, and I saw the situation, and you see the people dying without knowing Christ by hundreds by the day. For lack of the gospel, they're going to wish doctor. I didn't blame them. I was one person, and, and uh, what, what would I do? I heard about this movie, Jesus Fell, and borrowed a copy to play in my village. But there was a problem. Most people could not understand it. We ourselves were not happy bringing the Amharic Jesus film to the land because many of them could not understand it. But we had no option and showed it anyway. We showed the film in seven different villages. And you know what God did? Today, seven churches stand where the film was first seen. And by God's grace, those seven churches multiplied. Now over 40 churches with 12,000 believers. Every year, 700, 500 get baptized. And the believers will be here singing and worshiping. And my father was actually the first one to pop up and got into the water. He stood right in the middle of the water saying, listen, today I tell the devil, I'm not going to serve him anymore. Why? Because today I am a child and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for me. I tell you, that's when we know that God honored the ministry. Last year, when I learned the film would be recorded in the language of my people, I was so excited. All I could think was, now everyone will hear Jesus speak right to their hearts. Who can guess what God will do now? When word got around that Jesus' film will be translated in our language, we just couldn't believe. I couldn't contain my joy. I was crying, literally. I didn't know what to think. The joy of the people was beyond measure. It will be in our language. Those who don't speak Amharic will understand their message better. I'm so thankful and I'm so excited. I can't contain my joy. The film has come to the people in their own language. I'm just celebrating Jesus in the Gawada language. That's all I do. <laughs> I can feel Jesus here in our village today. This is something they will remember for a lifetime. Many do not read or write, but now they know about Jesus, and they actually see him talking in Gawada. How can I forget what I saw tonight? I will keep it in my heart until tomorrow morning. When the sun comes up, I will go tell others who have not heard this. I can't be quiet. <laughs> For God so loved the world, and he didn't only love America or Addis Ababa or some other country, but he loved them too. So he brought the message in their own language, something they had hard time grasping when it first presented to them in Amharic, now in their own language. It will produce more churches, more believers will come. This is the greatest moment of my own life. If there is God truly, and if we take the Bible to be the Word of God, and if Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, it is a serious business. And you need to have 
a means of communicating this crucial message, not only to the Gawada people, but to the people on the planet. You can't be quiet. All right, that was pretty good. What a great way to start uh, this evening to hear Benora's story. This is, this is just, he's one person, and we are going to go on a little journey tonight where we're going to hear many stories of what God's doing. Uh, my name is Ryan Wagner. I'm director of marketing and communications for Jesus Film Project, and I can say on behalf of the whole team here that we are excited to be here with you guys tonight. It's our privilege to be able to uh, facilitate almost this opportunity this evening to expose what God's doing around the world. And so I don't know any elements that stand out when you see that video. For me, it was 64 kids. That's the craziest thing. I've, I have two, and that's plenty for me, but 64 is uh, something to behold for sure. So we have, uh, we're going to start the wor the, this evening off with worship. We brought Ed and the worship team up here. And uh, it's really what this is doing is setting the tone for this evening where we're going to invite the Lord to be in this room, and I'll do that here in just a moment as we pray, but uh, that's what we want to be churned by His Spirit this evening. As we hear, we're going to hear from great leaders of the faith that have been doing the things around the world, uh, and things that we could even learn to even do here in Detroit. And so to do that, I'm going to pray and then invite here some worship. God, we are grateful for this evening. We ask you to, to move in the speakers that are going to hear and the things that we're going to hear and sh what, you will, uh, what you will show to us. And we ask for your spirit to even give us specific thoughts or things to think of as we, as we leave tonight. But right now, Lord, we want to surrender all the, the craziness of the week, the craziness of the month, uh, those things that are kind of pestering us and wanting us to, to, to check or think about or dwell on. But we want to rest those aside and uh, just be present here this evening as we learn more about your, uh, your will for the people all over the world. Amen. Amen. We're going to start off with a song that talks about how, Jesus, how powerful our God is. He's as fierce and as powerful as a lion, yet as gentle as if you will, as submissive as a lamb. That's what we just celebrated this past week. So would you stand and join us on this first song? One, two, one, two, three, four.
can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Ask that again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? lion and that lamb I guess paradoxically he's also our shepherd and I think the Jesus film project is all about making sure that the world knows that he's their shepherd he can be their shepherd too we just sing the 23rd song Lord is my shepherd He goes before me, defender behind me, I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing, I'm filled with anointing. overflowing no weapon can harm me no I won't fear sing hallelujah hallelujah I am not my comfort. He's my comfort, always holds me close. He always guides me. He always guides me. Through mountains and valleys, His joy is Mercy and goodness, mercy and goodness, give me a joy, and I'll see his glory face to face.
spirit lives within me. Your spirit lives within me. So I will walk in your, your peace. spirit. Your spirit lives my within victory. me. My victory. My victory. Your spirit. Your spirit lives within me. So I will walk in your it's peace. It's your spirit. Your spirit lives within me. My victory. My victory. Your spirit lives within me. So I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me. My victory. My victory. Your spirit lives within me. So I will walk in your peace. Sing hallelujah again. shepherd I have a lot less fear because I know that you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me they comfort me knowing that if I get a little bit out of line you will uh, you will gently set me straight and I can become more and more like your son and I believe that's what you have for the people of this world. We are, we are no uh, better than anybody else that's kneeling in front of the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for being willing to be nailed to a cross along with my sin. And anybody else that would accept your free gift. We love you very much. Thank you for loving us first and loving us most. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. When I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself that I am not a man condemned for Jesus Christ is my defense. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
All right. I got the best seat in the house in this corner here because I can watch Ed tickle the ivories all night, all night long. This guy's pretty good. All right. Okay, so I'm excited to get, to get going here tonight with, uh, with bringing up some really special speakers, uh, which is my privilege to introduce them tonight. But first, I wanted to kind of do a little history lesson with Jesus Film Project, what's once started as a film about the life of Jesus in 1979, has really uh, blown anyone's thought of what that could be out of the water. And really, it kind of started as a film that was uh, maybe a nice thing that might be able to get played around Easter time, kind of like the Ten Commandments, like what we've done over the years. And after a while, though, the theology got built out, and we thought this could be something that could really transform the kingdom to be able to reach people in their own language. And so with Paul Eshelman as an, uh, one of the original, the original director of Jesus Film Project, as he started to build out that concept, then we had Jim Green, who was another director of Jesus Film Project, who really worked on broadening the landscape of media, as we had had years and years of influence in seeing how media can impact the world. And what I like about who I'm getting ready to... Eric and Elizabeth, getting ready to introduce them here in a moment, is their heart preaches partnership. They love it. And we see that as a tremendous value of Jesus Film Project when we're looking at what the Great Commission holds as every tribe, language, nation, tongue represented in that final scene where we've all read the end of Revelation. That's this future reality that's come before us. And I've sat in pews just like this one, heard a pastor stand right in a spot like this, and I think, well, that sounds pretty cool, but how can we, how do we do it? And I get, we get the privilege to walk the hallways every day of thinking, this is how we're going to do it. And part of that is, is partnership along the way. So Eric and Elizabeth served as a director of Jesus Film Project for six years. And Eric, I have your title here now, Director of Church Partnership for Jesus Film Project, which is incredible. And so Eric... Uh, came from the Northeast. He's got his uh, couple master's degrees and a doctorate from Harvard. And uh, in, what is that? Study of religion. See, you, I got a meteorology degree. What am I doing up here? So then, uh, and Elizabeth is a tremendous writer who's served for years with her writing and production team. And they're both going to come up here right now and be able to kind of set the stage for what the rest of the evening holds. Did I get in the middle? Thank you, Ryan. 
We, uh, before we were from the Northeast, Elizabeth was from the Midwest, from Wisconsin, and always vacationed in Michigan. I grew up actually in Northern Kentucky and got involved in, at Harvard on the, uh, I guess on the, on the hillbilly uh, program. But uh, we, we love this area of the country. I always say uh, people from, I'm not just saying this to flatter you, I say this all the time. My COO and my administrative assistant when I was director of Jesus Film were both from Michigan, and I had to confess that Michiganers were the best people in the world. So it is a pleasure to be with you. It's a joy to, and a privilege for us to be with you and to share this event in which Crosspoint and Jesus Film are cooperating to celebrate the goodness of God and what he's doing in the world, and to do it in this beautiful sanctuary. And as Ryan said, these are great pews. I don't know if you've ever sat in the front row, but I mean, it is like, it is like sitting in the exit row. You get like this much extra leg room. And, and I think that was done strategically so you would fill the front row, which is usually empty in churches. So come forward sometime and, and take that opportunity. You know, we're, we are here to celebrate together the great love of God who loves the world so much that he sent his son and who sends us to make his love known to everyone in the world. One of my favorite scriptures is in 2 Peter chapter 3 when Peter is talking about the Lord's coming, his second coming, and, and he says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise to return, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter's saying that in a sense, Jesus is delaying his return until everyone would have a chance to hear because his heart is that every child and woman and man on the face of the earth could be returned to him in repentance and in faith and in love and live with him for all eternity. And that's really what we're all about, to see people's relationship with him restored. We are aware through the rhymers of how God has used you and his church to uh, extend yourselves to the world and uh, the heart that you have for world mission. About 25 years ago, Elizabeth and I were in a pastoral role in Arlington, Massachusetts, and God began to move on our hearts to give us a deeper vision for world mission. I was pastoring a church that we had helped start. I'd been pastor there for 22 years, and we were by that point, kind of living the pastor's version of the American dream. We had our nice house and two cars and five kids, a dog and a cat, and a uh, great town that we lived in. Our church was finally big enough that we were making ends meet. We'd started a Christian school, and uh, things were going quite well for us. I had just finished my graduate studies, and when I went back to, to do these graduate studies, some people told me, oh, don't study religion at Harvard, it's, you'll just lose your faith, and you'll get confused, and um, the only thing that confused me, the more I studied about the world, was why we weren't doing more around the world to share the gospel with everyone, and, and I came out of that program, that graduate program, uh, with, and Elizabeth and I both did, because we were sharing over these eight year, this eight-year period when I was pastoring and in school, uh, you know, what, what, what if it, God would give us the opportunity to go and share the gospel where it's not being shared? And, and we kind of began to look around to see what was going on around the world to get the gospel to those areas that people had never had an opportunity to hear or very little opportunity to hear. And we found the Jesus film. And at the time, our church had watched it years earlier, but weren't aware of what was going on around the world using the film, the translation work and extension uh, into so many unreached people groups. We found a book by Paul Eshelman, the founder of the Jesus film, called I Just Saw Jesus, 
and he told some stories like Benora's story, the one you heard on the video tonight, and our hearts were captivated by that opportunity. And at the time, after finishing the program, I had just gotten a, a job as chaplain in um, uh, the local Christian prep school down the road from us, continuing to pastor. But uh, it was a job that 125 pastors had applied for because it was great families, great people, and uh, just a great situation, and our church was doing well. And, but the, the Lord spoke to me in, in the depths of my heart, and I felt Him saying, you know, this job that you got that so many people wanted, why don't you let one of them take it? Do you really think most of them couldn't do it just as well as you can? Why don't you go do something nobody wants to do? And about that time, a young woman in our church stood up and announced that the, the, the crew chapter that she was a part of was adopting a city in the Muslim world in the former Soviet Union uh, called Tashkent in the newly formed Republic of Uzbekistan adopting this city to bring them the gospel. And my first thought when she stood up in church and shared that was, I wonder if God would ever give us an opportunity to do something like that. And so my son Daniel and I made a, a pastoral trip to visit their team a few months later. And when I came back from the trip, just what we had seen there and the opportunity, you know, 35 million people who were living in a country that had been 70 years under Soviet rule, no gospel preaching to speak of at all, and before that, a thousand years under the domination of Islam, emirs and hans, and, and no opportunity to share the gospel. The, the churches that had been planted there early in, in the history of Christianity had been destroyed, decimated. By, by Muslim conquerors coming from the east. And so almost an opportunity to, to go to a place where you could share with people and they hadn't heard before. And, and so we, uh, I got off the plane and, and uh, Elizabeth greeted me with the words, when are we moving? And I said, how did you know? And she said, well, I've been living with you for 22 years. <laughs> No, that's not what she said. That's what she thought, though. <laughs> no, the Lord had spoken to her as well. And uh, we were just being drawn into a deeper involvement with this matter of getting the gospel of eternal salvation to everyone. And, and so we were just so excited about the opportunity of packing up our house and giving away our dog and cat, and, and selling our cars, and getting our five kids, one in preschool, one in elementary school, one in middle school, one in high school, and one just out of high school, ready to move halfway across the world. And we were just carried by excitement about the mission that God was giving us an opportunity to be a part of. And you know what? Uh, having had some lumps along the way, we're just as excited about it today as we were then. Well, Elizabeth's going to share a little bit with you about our experience in Uzbekistan. So we, it, it was kind of like space travel or time travel because the environment was so different from what we had become used to in the United States. So we were just having fun. We learned Russian, which was hard, but we learned it. I mean, we're still learning it. They say they speak Russian in heaven because it takes forever to learn. But um, God connected us sovereignly with people who were already using the Jesus film in Uzbekistan. And so uh, we were able to help start churches and underground. Everything we did was underground. Eric used to say when we'd come back and speak to Sunday school classes here in the U.S. in the summertime, he'd say to kids, I remember especially one inner city church, he said, I break the law every day if I can, because <laughs> most of what we did was not really legal, but 
<laughs> preaching the gospel. And so, and so um, God just sovereignly blessed what we were doing. It was, it was a great privilege. And um, I remember we came back. We, uh, our kids started getting bigger, our sons, especially our older sons. And so they were eventually all three in the U.S. while we were in Uzbekistan with our two little girls who by this time were 12 and 8. They were 8 and 4 when we moved. And um, so we, we had been back for the summer, and we, we got back in, in the heat of August and uh, got rolling again with all the different things that, that Eric was doing, both in his official capacities at university and in our unofficial capacities um, working for the Lord. And um, one night we, we went to the girls' school. There was a little missionary school there. We went to the PTA meeting. And it was just another day, right? Um, got back from the PTA meeting, and I remember Eric saying to me before we went to bed, he said, I don't think I've ever been so tired in my life. And I thought, that's really saying something for, for this guy, because he goes like a house on fire. And we just fell into bed, and I woke up at 4 in the morning. It was raining outside, super dark, but I saw in the doorway of our bedroom a man standing in the doorway and I thought I wonder if Eric got sick I, he, I didn't hear him get up I wonder and so I just closed my eyes and then I felt very uneasy and I opened my eyes there was a man directly at the end of our bed and another man in the doorway and they had on like ski masks all you could see were their eyes um, what I didn't know was that they were carrying hatchets which was the weapon of choice for political assassinations in Uzbekistan, they would beat you with the blunt side of the hatchet until you were unconscious and then cut your head off. I didn't know all that right in that second, but I did feel as if the devil himself was in our bedroom. And I realized my husband was asleep next to me, and so I just yelled, Eric, wake up, they're here, like they were late dinner guests or something. And no sooner were the words out of my head than the first blow struck and broke my skull, and after that I couldn't even move. I couldn't defend myself, I couldn't do anything, and this guy on my side of the bed was beating me with the blunt side of the hatchet, and there was another guy on Eric's side of the bed beating him in the head with a blunt side of the hatchet, and all we could do was cry out to the Lord. It was so quiet. All you could hear was, Jesus, Lord Jesus, help me, Jesus. And they just kept beating and beating. And I had this conversation with God. I was like, Lord, where are you? Make it stop. Help me, Jesus. Then I thought, why aren't I unconscious? Could I please at least be unconscious now? This is not like the movies. I literally thought that in the middle of it. I thought, this is not like the movies. I should be unconscious. And then I said, finally, I said, I can't do this anymore. This is excruciating. I can't do this anymore. Please, Lord, I just want to see you. Let me just close my eyes and come. I'm done. I, this was my last day. I'm ready. And then I saw like, like a movie, not of my past life, but of the future. And I saw these two little girls growing up and going to high school and graduating, going to college and getting married and having kids and and there was no mom in the movie. And as soon as the movie was over, I said, Lord, remember what I said. I don't want that at all. I take it back. I'll do anything. I'll endure anything. Just please, God, let me live. And that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in the dark, somehow on the floor, um, bleeding from everywhere, um, in, in pain. And I started crying out for Eric. It was quiet. I called to Eric, I called to the girls, and there was no answer. And that was my actually my lowest point because I thought that they were all dead. And then I said, I, I examined myself and I thought, well, I'm Lord, I'm soon to come because I think I'm in pretty tough shape. And the first thing I did was to thank him. I didn't understand it, but I just knew I didn't want anything to be between me and my God. So I just said, thank you, God. 
And then I said, Lord, I forgive them. Please, Lord, forgive them. Let them come to know you. Let those men come to know you. And then I heard a sound, and I thought it was them coming back to finish me off, but it was Eric. He had somehow gotten a hold of the hatchet, wrestled the hatchet from the guy, and, and once Eric had a hatchet, they took off. Um, he found the girls hiding outside. They had their own encounters with the men. They were not physically hurt, thank God. He called the uh, emergency squad, and we waited and waited, and I was in and out of consciousness and in pretty tough shape. And, and at one point, as he was trying to take care of me while we waited, he said, honey, someday you're going to look back at this as the best day of your life. <laughs> I, I was like, what are you supposed to say? <laughs> But I'm so glad he said that because immediately I, I referenced all the stories I had read of people who had suffered for the sake of the gospel. And I thought, Lord, thank you for this opportunity. And it really set me on a path of not feeling sorry for myself because I was another, really another three or four years of, of recovering. Um, we went, we were finally taken to the hospital. We were ultimately airlifted out of the country to Europe. And I remember getting on that little cool Learjet plane. And I mean, I was wheeled onto the plane. And we start going down the runway. And when we took off, there was such relief to get out of there. Because we didn't know who these people were. We thought they would, you know, come back and finish us off. And as the plane lifted off the ground, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're not finished here. You need to come back. And I really received it as you get to come back. And I was so joyful. Eric, in fact, heard the same thing, knew the same thing, and came back within a month of our getting back to the US. He was, he was back in country. I said, you can go. I just need to hear your voice every day so I know you're alive. That's all I ask. And so we did. We, we did that transcontinental call every day. And the girls and I stayed in the U.S. I needed surgery and this and that and the other. Um, we all had counseling and therapy, and I had physical therapy. And, um, but we went back. After 10 months, the girls and I joined Eric in Uzbekistan, and it was like day and night. Whereas before, we were the rich Americans. You know, guilty as charged. We are all, regardless of our income, the rich Americans, relative to what they live with day in and day out. We were the rich Americans who didn't know what we were talking about. But God gave us a story. God gave us a union with them in suffering because they had all suffered under Stalin, under Khrushchev, under the Soviet Union, under the present government. They had all suffered. And so this really, I do look back at it, and I say, thank you, God. What a gift. I never would have signed up for it. But I'm so grateful. God is so good. Thank you, hon. Elizabeth will come back in just a minute, or a few minutes, and uh, share some more about women's ministry. But let me share a little bit more about what we've had the privilege of being a part of during our 10 years, 11 years in Central Asia, and then during our time um, in the Muslim area, another five years, and then our, our years with Jesus Film back here in the U.S. Just as Benora, the, the man in the video, saw people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ in their heart language is so powerful. When we came to Uzbekistan, we came at a time when the Russians, who were the colonial or the imperial, you know, the big empire, had left, and the people were very nationalistic, returning to their own roots, returning to their own languages. And they had always been taught, you know, our heritage is Muslim, and Jesus is the Russian God. And so, don't have anything to do with Jesus. 
And we arrived just shortly after the Jesus film had been translated into several of those local languages and were there as it was being translated into others into Tajik and Kazakh and Karakalpak and the other languages of Central Asia. And people could no longer say Jesus is the Russian God because they heard him speaking their language. Shortly after we'd been, uh, after we arrived in Tashkent, Elizabeth jumped in a taxi cab one night and a taxi cab in a city like Tashkent is any car. You just go like this and one stops and you hop in, and it's usually professional people who can't make enough money at their jobs, but have enough money to own an old, rickety Soviet vehicle who would drive you wherever you were going to go for a little bit of money. So she hops in, and it turns out in this case it's a young man who um, spoke English, and, had, uh, and, and right away Elizabeth was able to uh, strike up a conversation with him. And... Uh, uh, she would look for a way to share the gospel with any taxi driver she encountered. And so uh, before she had a chance to get to that point, he said to her, Do you know Jesus? And uh, she said, Yeah, do you? And he said, Well, yes. And she said, Well, how did you hear about Jesus? And he had heard about Jesus from uh, one of the teams working in the university there. And he said, you know, they gave me the Jesus film. And they gave it to me in, they got, they got me a Jesus film in Tatar, which is my family's native language. And I took it home and played it for my family. And my whole family watched it with me, including my grandmother. And when she saw it, with tears streaming down her face, she gave her life to Jesus and she said, he speaks my language, he's my God. And we saw this happen all through Central Asia. When people could understand Jesus speaking their language, it made such a difference. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this, but Jesus didn't speak English. I mean, it's just silly for me to even say that. But we're so accustomed to being able to see him and hear him speak our language in film and you know, we've had the Bible in English for so many generations. We're so privileged, but it's our turn to give back. We, this, wherever we were from, you know, most of us of European background probably in this room, these strange tribes in whatever stage of development we were in in Europe, when someone had the courage to translate the Bible into our languages, it changed us. It transformed our forefathers. It transformed our culture. And it's time for us to see that make the same difference for every tribe and tongue in the whole world. We had the privilege of working with a group of Jesus Film team members in Uzbekistan when we'd been there a couple weeks. A woman uh, named Olga uh, asked us to dinner, and we went to dinner in her home, and, and we had heard about Olga. We had heard she's the Billy Graham of Uzbekistan. Well, we didn't know exactly what that meant. There weren't all that many believers yet in Uzbekistan, but she was one of the most courageous among them. Her family had been jailed during the Soviet period for being Russian Baptists. And the worst thing they could think to do to a Russian Baptist when they jailed them was send them to the Muslim parts of the empire. So they jailed them in Uzbekistan. And so that's how her family got to Tashkent. Well, she had, by the time we met her, become the home mission director for the entire denomination in Uzbekistan, which it was a couple thousand people at, when Uzbekistan became independent, and quickly dwindled as as many of those Baptists as could possibly do it, immigrated back to Russia or to the U.S. out of fear of what would happen when there was a, a Muslim-oriented government back in place. But instead of leaving, Olya decided that she was going to evangelize the Uzbek people. And she was looking for bold young people who were willing to do that. And she found the Jesus film and some young men. So 
about two weeks after we had dinner with her, that, the night we had dinner with her, she, it was like an interrogation. She just fired one question at us after another about who we were and why we came and what our background was and what we knew and didn't know and one thing and another. Knocks on our door two weeks later, late at night, and, and uh, you know, I scrambled, pulled my pants up and went and ran outside and opened the gate. And there she stands with one guy about this tall, skinny as a rail, another guy about this tall, Real, real broad, both of them tattooed from the neck down. Both had served in the Soviet Navy and were ragtag Jesus film team members on her team committed to take the bold step of evangelizing Muslim background people. The government drew the line there. If you evangelized Russians, it was okay. They were going to leave anyway. But Uzbek meant you had to remain Muslim. Well, she... Was, had built this team. And basically, she, she said to me that night, well, the first thing she said was, get in the car. Well, I had only met her once, and these two guys look pretty tough, so I, I, I hesitated, believe me, before I did it, but I got in the car. And she, she took us to this apartment that she said wasn't bugged, and hers was, and she said, I'm going to be thrown out of the country tomorrow. I have to flee. The government's given me till tomorrow to get out. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to a neighboring country and, and I'd like you to work with these guys. Well, it was the greatest privilege of my life to, to work with these guys uh, showing the Jesus film throughout uh, Uzbekistan and then through them and our association uh, with the teams in, in other Central Asian countries to be a part of what God was doing in that country. Uh, in that part of the world. And, and then as a bonus, after we returned, after our, our incident, uh, I had been back by this time 10 months. Elizabeth gets back. And how, how many days was it later? 9-11. About two weeks later, 9-11. So we watch on a little, everybody has their 9-11 story. Ours was watching the towers fall on a little Soviet TV in an apartment in Tashkent, Elizabeth just having come back from being beaten nearly to death by the same people that were now attacking our nation and watching the towers fall on the TV. And a long story, I wish I could tell the whole story, I can't, about how the Lord uh, graced us during that period of time, uh, during the Afghan war. And, uh, but as, as a result of, of being back in the country, um, Afghanistan opened up, uh, and we were there at the time. And I, I was thrust into a position of being the person who was able to negotiate the opening of the bridge between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan so that Western aid could go into northern Afghanistan just two weeks after the Battle of Kali Jangi in the north that drove the Taliban south into the middle of the country. And so we eventually opened three training centers there where we very quietly but effectively showed the Jesus film as part of our English language training curriculum. And we had exciting times, times of showing the film to young men on Easter wondering what they were going to think and realizing that, you know, instead of, instead of recoiling at the violence done to Jesus, when the Quran teaches, you know, God would not allow his prophet to suffer that way. But when they see it, we didn't know how they'd respond. Well, they, you know, they were just so deeply moved and ashamed that that, uh, that happened to a prophet of God. And so just so many doors opened for us as we showed the film. And, and I saw another powerful way that God was using the film. I was in the city of Herat where we were opening a training center and uh, staying in the guest house of of a humanitarian assistance organization, and there was a, a, a doorkeeper there who spoke, one, spoke Russian so I could communicate with him, and um, it was prayer time when I'm coming in the gate. So uh, the call to prayer rings out throughout the cities in Afghanistan loudly. Um, we, we, you, you hear it, and it, it's, you know, depending on how you respond to it, it can sound really threatening and eerie, but you kind of get used to it, and you think, okay, well, this is a call to prayer. I'm going to pray. So um, I said to him, 
the, the call to prayer, are you going to pray? Knowing he was a Muslim. And he said, yes, I'm going to pray. And I said, well, I, I will too. And uh, he said to me, but I've got a question for you. You Christians, why don't you wash your head and your hands and your feet before you pray the way we Muslims do? And I thought, Lord, well, how should I answer that one? And what came to my mind was uh, the words of Jesus. And I said, you know, God te- Jesus teaches that it's not our hands and our feet and our head being dirty that, that destroys our ability to pray. It's our heart being dirty. And so the real question is, how can you get a clean heart? And, and so he looked at me, and I was expecting to see a hard face like I generally saw in that country from, from people when you talk about Jesus. I, as I shared with him the good news about how Jesus died so he could be cleansed from his sin in his heart. And, and I didn't get a hard face. I said, Are you gonna, would, would, you, would you pray that way when you pray and accept Jesus? And he said, yes, he would. Well, the next morning I asked him, and sure enough, he had. So I asked him, why were you so receptive to my words as a follower of Jesus, asking you to become a follower of Jesus? And he said, well, you know, several months ago, somebody was staying at this guest house, and they gave me a little MP3 player with the Jesus film audio on it. And I've been listening to it again and again and again. And I thought, wow, you know, Talk about somebody who was ready. And, and I realized that we have sewn copies of the Jesus film into closed countries around the world, both the film and the audio, by literally by the tens of millions. And when we hear Muslims moving toward Christ in many countries as they are, I have to believe it's because of the word that's been sown that's renewing people's minds and cleansing their minds. Because studies show that for someone who's in Islam or another religion like that, it takes a number of hearings of the gospel for them to be ready to make that step and give their life to Christ. And so uh, we're so excited about what God is doing, not only at that moment when a person makes a decision, but the work he's doing through the gospel and preparing them for that moment and then taking them on into discipleship. And of course, the Jesus Film app that we're going to hear about tonight. Um, I Thank you so much for uh, your openness to Jesus Film Ministry. You're going to hear tonight about a, a telephone app or a, a, a tablet app that will literally enable you to share the gospel in 1,700 languages with anybody you meet right here in town. And the, as a result of technology, last year, just in one year, there were over 300 million views of all or one of the clips of the Jesus film. Over 300 million. And, and you know, we often fuss about technology and how the devil uses it and the internet and how difficult it is to, to do anything righteous with it. But believe me, God is using technology. There are incredible things going on around the world and God is, works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I heard a story today from one of our staff who's here over lunch uh, at the Rhymers about her son who serves in China and shows clips of the Jesus film on WeChat, which is their version of, uh, of Facebook. And uh, over two years, they've had two million views of clips with commentary in China. Again, a country where you read in the news and hear a crackdown is going on. It's more difficult right now to do face-to-face ministry in parts of China. But information technology, communication technology has done away with the idea of a closed country. The Chinese can't keep the gospel out. They're not going to close down WeChat. And, and uh, they, they, uh, um, 
our friend's son who, who works there says three to 4,000 people making commitments to Christ every month through WeChat, and three to 400 of them, they're able to steer into local house churches. They have a, they're part of a network of house churches, 2,700 house churches. Uh, the largest church in the Arab world is an online church. 200,000 people weekly tune in to a worship service online, and including in the most closed Muslim countries. You cannot stop it. It's an opportunity for a person who could get themselves in real trouble if they let it be known that they're interested in Jesus. It's an opportunity for them again and again and again to watch and listen and be a part of God's work in cleaning their soul. God's working powerfully in parts of the world that we've often thought of as the more difficult places in the world. Please do not be discouraged about God's work in the world. Often here in America, we look at our own country and we look at Europe and we say, wow, we're losing. Do you know sub-Saharan Africa is virtually entirely Christian? Do you know that the largest, strongest mission sending impulses in the world, do you know where they are right now? Korea has been for a good decade or more. But China is sending missionaries and saying, we're going to send people all the way back to Jerusalem. There's a, a back to Jerusalem movement among Chinese Christians. There's a go north movement from sub-Saharan Africa going to the Muslim north in Africa to bring the gospel. I was in Singapore recently, and uh, they told me, that the group of Christians I was with said, you know, we Singaporean believers are convinced that God has told us that we are the Antioch of Asia. We're going to win Asia to Christ. Singapore. And, and so we need to realize that what's happening is that people like our friend Benora are the ones who are getting the job done. The local believers who are going to the next village and the next town and the next neighborhood and the next high-rise apartment and taking the message of Christ so successfully. There's so much more I would love to share with you, but let me close my time by by saying, by saying this, I, I like to tell stories about what's going on in the field, but I like to tell stories too about what's going on here as we Americans who may never go, may never be called to leave the borders of this country, the difference we can make. And I, we're going to hear about a lot of ways you can get involved tonight and I, I don't mean to focus on finances, but let me tell you a couple people's stories. We have uh, one friend who flips houses in California. Flips a couple houses a year. Been doing it for years and years and years. A lot of people in California flip houses to get rich. He gives every penny to World Mission, to Bible translation in the Jesus film. I, I couldn't tell you how many millions of dollars he's given. And if he walked in a room today with his baseball cap on and his blue jeans, you would probably look askance at him. I've watched him walk into briefings where everybody's in a fancy hotel and dressed in their best clothes and trying to look good enough to be there. And he walks in dressed just like he does when he's flipping those houses. And I just, I just watch people and I think if you only knew who this man is. And we were in Ohio uh, not too long ago, and we were with a couple who have given very generously to World Mission. And they were showing us their business and how they made their money. He made most of his money in, in scrap, in, in trash and garbage. And he, so he took me up to the top of the landfill that was a result of years of work. And he said, I just wanted to show you if you stand up here on top, you can see all the way into the next county. And I'm thinking, here's a man who has literally affected the corners of the earth with his giving. Who's excited about being able to see into the next county. I think about a man who's from the city where we were living in the U.S. in Boston who 
is on disability, who's not able to do much of anything with work or certainly never be able to travel, who for 24 years has not failed once to send us a monthly check of support, $25. And I think there are heroes in every part of the work. We had the privilege of going. It's as big a challenge for us now that we're back to give. But the challenge before all of us is to find our place and to be a part of this process of God's great love going to everyone everywhere. Well, before Elizabeth comes back to share about what we're seeing happen among women around the world, we're going to watch a little video. You know, it's been such a wonderful privilege for us to be here in Malawi. And we're celebrating the 150th language for the Magdalena translation. And it's in the language of the Yao people. Now the Yao people are very unreached and they speak the language in Malawi and also in Mozambique. You know, this Magdalena was made specifically for abused people. And our vision was just to reach the abused people in Afghanistan. But we realized that everywhere in the world there are abused people. And even more so over here. Our whole strategy is to teach them these oral stories and they all developed around Magdalena, the movie. So we have um, ladies here from eight different countries that we've already done the training in. We taught them three stories and uh, they share the stories that they've learned with the people in the villages. So they went out two by two and they shared with 156 people and 36 people became Christians, gave their lives to Christ just through these stories. It was difficult for me to tell a story, but two days ago, I learned how to tell a story, how to begin a story and how to finish it. Now I have this confidence in me that I can tell story to others. When I went to share out there, it was very interesting even to those who are listening to me. They heard me and they accepted the story. My favorite story has been that of the Samaritan woman because this woman took the message to her people in the village and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? 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 The promised prophet? No, it can't be. Come and see. Come. I want to be like her. In fact, I'm already like her now that I've learned that it's really necessary to go back to tell people what we've received from Jesus Christ. So from here, I'm now the witness of Jesus Christ. I've liked this story very much. The ladies that have come here from Rwanda, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, Ethiopia, Madagascar, Mozambique, if you count all these ladies' reports together, and we've had wonderful results. This is like a fire that you cannot turn out. God is using women as a mighty army, and we know that God's going to use us in mighty, mighty ways. Cool. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about what God's doing through women around the world. You know, we say we want to reach the whole world, and statistically, a little over half of the whole world are female. So um, we about, as the Afghan war was kind of wrapping up, uh, some of our staff decided we should make a film for Afghan women, women who had been so mistreated and abused, um, so devalued. And so that is why we created Magdalena, a film about Jesus' healing and interaction and commissioning of women. We took the 
existing clips from the Jesus film, and we added stories from John, the woman at the well, the woman with um, caught in adultery, and we wove together a story of the gospel for women. We made it for the Muslim world, but it's gone around the world. And uh, then, then we were asked to do a follow-up series. And so I was blessed to be asked to do the screenwriting for the series called Rivka, which is a 12-part series. It's basically a soap opera. I mean, we sat down and we said, what can we do? Again, we designed it for the Muslim world. Muslim women, women in that part of the world, love their soap operas. And so I wrote it. You know, it's got life, death, romance, sickness, health, whatever, everything um, in 12 episodes, and each episode opens up some aspect of practical theology. What is prayer? How do we pray? How about the Word of God? How do you, how do you know that's the Word of God? How do you study the Word of God? Um, what does sanctification mean? I remember we, we did that with uh, wool, uh, sheep's wool. The women are sitting around carding wool, and they say, well, you know, we're like this dirty wool. We're just a mess. But when God looks at us, as when we look at this wool, we imagine the carpet that we're going to weave from it with all the colors and the patterns. When God looks at us, he sees who we are in Christ. And he's putting us through that process of, of stretching and carding and washing and changing to make us who we need to be, that sanctification. And... So we also have a Bible study series called Reflection of Hope that goes with the different clips of Magdalena. And I've been blessed to travel around the world and see these tools being used through different people and strategies around the world. If, I, if we drop down to Panama, I had the privilege of going to a, the women's, the main women's prison in Panama. We have constant cycles of Reflections of Hope, the Bible study that goes with Magdalena. In, in the prison in Panama. And they've gotten actually permission to do that because we did a few pilot programs and the women's lives were so affected that the, the prison administrators said, you should come back and do those, more of this because it was helping the prison population. And when they were getting out, they weren't returning because their lives were changed by the power of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. I've been in Bolivia. We had a, a woman who was on crew staff with her husband. She's actually a dentist, and um, so well-educated woman. She'd worked in one city for 10 years, and they, they'd worked together and, and really had seen no fruit. They were becoming discouraged. She, she heard about Magdalena from our, our women's strategy coordinator for that part of the world, and she decided to start trying it. And the first door that opened was in, in the school system. This Bolivia is a communist country. But because they're so desperate for help in the inner cities, in the barrios, they were willing for anybody to come and do anything if they could do it for free. And so they started doing Bible studies with the, the moms of the students in this school. And it just caught on like wildfire. The next thing you know, she's doing it in a university. She's doing it with, with uh, educated women with professional women, with women in government. It's been incredible. And this is in, in Bolivia. Then I've been to India and met amazing women. Uh, some of them from the Christian South, but some of them from places like Kolkata. Women who grew up as Hindus and now have been, their lives have been revolutionized by the gospel, by the love of Jesus, and they're going out in the city of Calcutta and taking the good news and bringing people in and showing them these films that, that describe so vividly for them in their own heart languages the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have dynamite in our hands. We have life-changing power in our hands. And, and when we get it out, and women are so effective because we are very, tend to be, not all of us, but we do tend to be social, and we like to be with each other. Uh, I was in, um, in Africa, in um, Ethiopia, 
And I met a woman named Marta. Marta was so burdened for the women of Ethiopia, and she wanted to figure out how to effectively reach women. And so she and a small group of women on staff decided to fast and pray. They said they would fast and pray. One of them at all times for 21 days would be fasting and praying. They even rented a little apartment that would be their prayer place. And so whoever was fasting and praying for those hours would be in that apartment. And then they would periodically all gather and, and pray together. And so they did it for 21 days. And after 21 days, Marta said, we hadn't really heard the Lord. So we said, well, we should fast and pray for another seven days. So another seven days, she said, but we just hadn't really heard the Lord yet. And so another 12 days, they got to 40 days. And on the 40th day, the lights went on and she said, oh my goodness, the coffee ceremony. Well, it turns out there's a tradition in Ethiopia in every neighborhood and every apartment building that the women, they don't just drink coffee. You know, coffee is from Ethiopia, if you didn't know that. Um, they don't just drink coffee. They roast it in their living rooms. They roast the coffee, the fresh coffee. They take it and roast it. And then they grind the coffee. And then they brew the coffee. And then they drink the, the coffee. They do this at least twice a day. And they do it in groups. They do it as neighbors. And the whole time they gossip. And she said, instead of gossip... We'll bring the gospel. And so they started showing clips of Magdalena during the coffee ceremony. This caught on to the point that a year and a half after that 40th day, Judy Douglas and I were invited to speak to the 7,500 women who had come to Christ and were actively involved in extending this ministry, not just in in the main city, but out in the countryside, they came together, this amazing group of women, and, and we taught them and we trained them further how to use not only Magdalena, but Rivka through the coffee ceremony. There are now hundreds of thousands of women who are coming to know Christ because that woman fasted and prayed with her friends. Women are powerful. There's a woman in Zimbabwe and to be honest, our ministry didn't even really want her to do this. They kind of wanted her to get with the program, but she said, no, I've got to take Magdalena out and show it. And so she started going out in the countryside. She now has 400 disciples. They've already planted 40 churches. God is at work. Brigitte, we have this beautiful backpack. And uh, this, is, this is the projector and they can show, with this projector and these speakers, they can show a group of 200 people with clarity, Magdalena or the Jesus film or Rivka or whatever they're doing. Well, my friend Brigitte, who's only a little younger than I am, also got a hold of a motorcycle. So she's like on fire. So I have pictures of her, which I'm stupid enough that I didn't bring those pictures, but you'll just have to picture it with me. My beautiful black friend Brigitte with her lovely friends, and they have their beautiful, colorful clothing on, and they're all on the back of the motorcycle, and the last one's wearing the backpack, and they're going out into the villages showing Magdalena, and people are coming to Christ. Our women are on fire. The Magdalena sisters in Algeria who started sneaking into hospitals to pray for people, and people started being healed. Again, the administrators came to them. They said, we've noticed that you come, and after you're with the people, there's remarkable change. Would you, would you come? Can we make this official? And so they go to hospitals in Algeria and pray for people, the Magdalena sisters. Syria, in Damascus, throughout the war, the women said, don't stop. Let us continue to come. Let us continue to bring our friends. Can you imagine that? Risking, literally risking their lives to come together, to study the word, to hear Jesus speak to them in their own heart language. I have a friend who presented the Magdalena film to a whole room about this big, filled with the wives of the people that we are all afraid of in Jordan. These were the women who were married to the men who were carrying out 
horrible things. And in fear and trembling, my friend got up and said, I want to show you a movie. By the end, they're weeping. They're crying. They're raising their hands. They're praying and they're saying, thank you for bringing me to Isa Masih. God is at work in incredible ways, in places that we can't imagine, places like Saudi Arabia, places like Iran. I don't have time to tell you all of it, but let me tell you that God loves men and women. God is working through men and women to reach the waiting world. And we get to be a part of it, whether we go on a short-term mission trip or whether we pray. Don't ever be discouraged in your prayers. Our prayers are powerful. Our prayers are, are the fuel behind the move of God. Or if you have the opportunity to give, we all have a role to play. And we live in an amazing historic time. So thank you for listening to Eric and me, and we'll turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. Do, uh, it reminds me, Eric, you said, do not be discouraged by what God is doing. Is anybody discouraged? I don't think so, but we forget. So thank you, Eric and Elizabeth, for reminding us uh, of what's happening around the world. Uh, Eric, you alluded to it earlier, but uh, technology and the app that Jesus Film Project has created is a part of opportunity. What we like to think of is uh, around the world, every day, a million people go online that had never been online before. And in the space of global missions, we don't see that necessarily as, uh, as a problem, but it's an incredible opportunity. Just last year, I had the privilege to meet with, on behalf of Jesus Film Project, uh, one of the CEOs of the largest telecommunications companies in the world. Uh, they're on, he's the CEO of, they're on your phone, they, some of them. <laughs> and uh, because he loves Jesus, and he loves what Jesus Film Project was doing, a few stories got to him, and he wanted to hear more. And I remember sitting down in his living room and he said, he said, by the time I die, there's going to be this, a smartphone in the hand of every person on the planet. That's part of our goals as a company in order to help make that happen. And I love that because I got to resonate with someone who's talking the same type of numbers that we talk about as a ministry. Same goals. I said, look, if you reach that goal, then we get to help reach the goal of every person on earth being able to have the gospel at a finger's touch away. And so Carrie pulled the short straw to follow Elizabeth here. And uh, she's going to come up. Carrie, she's been on staff with Crew for many years. She is a very gifted mobilizer. Great storyteller. She works with church planners, disciple makers all over the world. Uh, when she's not traveling 40% of her year, she lives from Atlanta and uh, is here to help guide us into further opportunity, not only in the technology space, but for us right now. Thank you so much, loud voice. Uh, but basically, you have the ability to 
interact with people that don't speak your main language. And you may be thinking, there's no way that that's possible. But as I'm out and about in Atlanta, and often I have to take an Uber to go to the airport, I get in the car and I'm usually frazzled because I need to get out there and I'm like, I need to get to the airport. And one of my favorite things as I travel is when I hear an accent. An accent is one of the best things that leads me into conversation. And so I get in the Uber and I hear the man, he says, oh, where are you going? And I was like, oh, to the airport. And I say, say some country, I said, I detect that you have an accent. He said, oh yes, I am from Nigeria. And I said, oh, what language do you speak? And then he says, I speak Urbu. And I'm like, oh, so I basically take my phone and at the bottom of the app, depending on your iPhone or an Android, if you're an Android user, it's on the vertical side. If you have an iPhone, it's at the bottom and there's a map button at the bottom. And so I test my geographical skills really quickly and I move over to Africa and I hit Nigeria and I say, is this your language? And it shows all the different languages and then it'll have 14 different fields. And he says, oh yes, it is. And I said, I have 14 languages in your native tongue. And he goes, can you send this to me? And I said, I can. And he goes, here is my number. It's not the Uber number that you called. Send it to me, send it to me. And he goes, can I send it to my family back in Nigeria? And I said, yes, you can. And what ends up happening is this app is for free. And people will say, if I share it with somebody, and then they share it with somebody, and they share it with somebody, is it still free? I said, it is all free. And so there's this beautiful thing about using the app that begins to negotiate that conversation that can often feel like a barrier to how do we begin to engage with other people. And so now we're going to look at, besides the Jesus film, and Elizabeth alluded to Magdalena and the Reflections of Hope, there are other films on the app that you can utilize. I learned from one of our African staff that there are over three years of content and information that you could spend looking at the Jesus film app and not run out of content for three years. I thought, I had no idea that that was possible, but I'm glad to know that I can share it with others so that they can use it. I want us to go, if you were to go on the film button at the bottom, you will see a whole list of all these different uh, films that we have. And in the short film area, there's another whole list of films with different languages and translations. I want to walk us through watching a film, and then I want to dialogue with you what you see about the film. So we're going to show a film, and it's called La Liberté.
Okay, so we're going to have a roaming mic, and we're going to walk through these first two questions. So don't be afraid to share with me. Who gives this man his freedom? You can raise your hand. Beth can come find you. The former prisoner? Okay. It's not a wrong answer. Why do you think he's glad to go help others? He's free. Oh, Portia said he's free. He's been cleansed. What else? He notices what he sees, his gifts, and wants to share it with others. Other thoughts? He's seen the light. What are some other things you observe about the film as well, not just from these questions? All looking for the same thing. Only one word was spoken. Good. A lot of people need help. A lot of people don't know there's freedom outside. That's good. Say again, I'm sorry. The darkness inside. Mm Mm-hmm. I love one of my favorite parts is the contrast of the color, of the gray to the seeing in color, and how that, the slow progression. No? I'd love to hear your thoughts. It takes action on our part. It takes action on our part. That's right. It's not, it is not that difficult to do. So these questions, when you're on your app and you're under La Liberté, these questions are listed there. So these aren't something that you have to have memorized where you have to think, I've got to be a good question asker. I've got to know the right things to say. They're all on the app. And basically with each film, and one of the things is on the Jesus film specifically, they've broken it up in 61 different clips. And so one of the things that I like to do is I started to go through reading the book of Luke. And as I would read a story in scripture, I would then go to the Jesus film and watch that clip to add more. It's like I've seen the Jesus film, but to go and specifically watch it but then it enabled me to engage with other people as I was out. And so the story that I like the most is the story of Bartimaeus because I lived in Ethiopia for a year and I understand the context of the beggars along the streets and the significance of them being there. And so oftentimes as I'm talking to the Uber driver and I'm not quite sure where they are and we've gone through the languages, I've told them about the app and I can see that there's no interest. I'll say, is there anything right now that you're crying out to God for? Is there anything that you're longing to get answers to? And then we get into a dialogue, and then we begin to talk to each other, and I often ask, like, if there's anything I could pray for you, what would it be? But then I also end up sharing the Bartimaeus app, or the clip from it. The next part is knowing how to share clips specifically. So Elizabeth referred to the Reflections of Hope, also listed on there. The very first clip that you can watch is on Jesus, our loving pursuer. And if you notice the arrow pointing, going to your right, my left, Um, that is what you would click to then find uh, your iMessage, your Gmail, your WeChat, your Messenger, and all that. And the beauty of using this allows you to then follow up with the conversation. And I've actually done this with several Uber drivers in Atlanta that have allowed me to interact with them over text appropriately and continue to keep asking them questions and know their world. One of the things I've learned in living overseas and then coming back is oftentimes internationals do not engage in coming into the homes of Christians. And by being out and about, the Lord has pressed upon me, how are you going to engage both your worlds of being in Atlanta and going overseas? And so being able to interact with people ease and by asking them a simple question of how is their accent. Tonight you've heard a lot of information, and I want to close with this. You may be sitting here thinking, gosh, I wish so-and-so would have come, or wow, they really need to know about this app. But in the more tab at the very bottom, you can go and it says share this app. Or you can put um, learn more about the Jesus film. It has nothing to do with giving, but just the reality of who is Jesus film and how can I learn more. Thanks so much.
What's your ambition? Anybody with any gifts can use the skills they have to help fulfill the Great Commission. What's your ambition? I am inspired by all the different media tools we get to make. I get to make movies that affect communities, cultures, and continents. I love that I'm in a job where I can use the gifts and skills that God has given me to help fulfill the Great Commission and that it's a ton of fun. Every day there are people in another country that are hearing Jesus for the first time in their heart language. And not only are they hearing Him, but they're seeing Him. I have been to more places in these last three years working with the Jesus Film Project than most people go to in a lifetime. Because of what I do, someone somewhere has a chance to say yes to Jesus every day. We get to dream and imagine how to open up doors and conversations that help lead people to Jesus. And films are one of the best ways to do that. Whether you're in an urban, media sophisticated place, or you're in the rural parts of West Africa or South Asia or anywhere in the world. We wanna help people accelerate church planting. We wanna reach unengaged, unreached people. And we wanna see every person have an opportunity to know Jesus. The most exotic place that I've ever been to was Indonesia. We landed on a volcano that was still active and you could see the scorch marks all around it. I knew I wanted to create film. I knew I wanted to serve Jesus. I just didn't know how that was gonna to fit together. You don't have to have it all figured out before you get involved. I have a degree in business and operations management, and I wasn't really sure how I could use that in missions, but being part of the Jesus Film Project has allowed me to leverage my skills for the Great Commission. We've always been about taking the message of Jesus to people wherever they are. In the beginning, we took it to them on the large screens in the villages, but now we want to put it on the screens in their pockets. Cell phones, smartphones, tablets, computer, wherever the people are, that's where we want to be. One of my favorite parts of my job is that digital media is the next phase of modern missions. We're seeing things like smartphones change the world and change the way that people communicate. Um, and every day I get to come into work and design new strategies on how to implement film into the digital space. So someone might search a phrase on Google and then find themselves at a clip of the Jesus film, Magdalena, a short film, anything from our entire library, and it will lead them um, to a website where they might be able to get their questions answered, where they can make a decision for Christ, or where they can be followed up. And so we want to help people have the whole experience at their fingertips. The work we do here gets multiplied in amazing ways. Every hour, 633 films are watched on our app in 63 different countries and 32 languages. We need people like writers, we need people like software engineers, we need people who are good at analytics, graphic designers. We need social media people, marketers, filmmakers, people with all kinds of skills. So the whole body of Christ can be found here at the Jesus Film Project, taking the message of Jesus to people all over the world. Every day I get to come into work and work with people who are changing people's lives, and that's really life-giving to me as well. At the Jesus Film Project, we're creating life-changing encounters with Jesus through film. I love that I get to use my unique skills to help make that happen. You know what I call that video? The shameless plug video. Because we need, you just heard great stories, we need more people. So we love showing that when we come to moments like this because maybe there's people here in this room that resonated with that type of opportunity or maybe you even have a background uh, with certain expertise that could help missions in a variety of ways. We'd love to talk with you too. And we'll have moments like that. We'll be mingling and small talking in the back here in just a little bit. But right now, what I wanted to do before we close out this evening is invite Pastor Matt and Portia and just you guys. That's it. No more. Just you guys. I want to just start by uh, thanking all of you for coming out tonight. This has been a privilege uh, for us to see how the Word of God is being spread around the world. And I, I do want to give a special thanks to, to the Rhymers and, and your connection with the Jesus Film folks. And I want to thank you guys for coming out and putting this on. This, is a, this has been a great night, and, and I just thank you for your passion for getting the gospel out. And uh, Portia Bunt has a little, uh, little gift that we want to talk about. So Portia, go ahead. We have a big surprise, and so uh, we'd like to tell you that tonight we have a little story to tell. Thirteen years ago, Pastor Matt 
and a group of NAB missionaries, pastors, missionaries, went to the Balkans to minister to the Roma people, otherwise known as gypsies in a derogatory term. People who are despised and persecuted. You've heard our NAB missionaries stand on this platform and tell you about the hard lives of Roma women. How some of them are married off at 11. How they don't have a written language. They, they aren't allowed to go to school. And so our own denomination has a program that ministers to the Roma people called Chi. And it's a holistic program to meet their health needs, but also through that to bring the gospel and evangelism to these people. Uh, half a million people living in the Balkans, uh, many do not know Jesus. In fact, some of the churches won't even let them come to hear about Jesus. So the next thing that happened is our own uh, Andy Draper and Ralph went back after the pastors came and helped build a church for one of the Roma communities there. I think our other pastor, Jason, I think his family ministers in Hungary, and they go there sometimes. There are Roma people all over Hungary and the Balkans. So we took your money that you have been giving for the last two years, and part of that money that goes out from this church, 15% now, that comes in the door, goes back out to missions. And $38,000 of those very special dollars that you gave as a congregation, we would like to present to the Jesus Film Project tonight. Elizabeth, my friend, will you and Eric come up? We're excited about this because this check for $38,000 from you guys to help send the gospel around the world will be used to translate six segments of Rivka in the Romani Balkan language. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Here's the other exciting part. Gateway teams from the NAB denomination goes to the Balkans to take special short-term missions trips. Some of you in this congregation have put that backpack on your back and shown the Magdalena where churches were planted in Paraguay, where there are little children in Awana programs today, 100 of them each week, that hear the story of Jesus. It started by showing the Magdalena in Rincon in Paraguay maybe nine years ago, 10 years ago. So we would like to say thank you to all of you. It's so exciting to see you here. I was afraid, you know, like when I got married, I looked in and said, someone look in and make sure there are people in there. <laughs> so I'm so happy to have you here. So we pray that many of you, even with your families, will want to go on a short-term missions trip, perhaps to the Balkans, perhaps to somewhere else. But right now, we'd like to ask Pastor Matt to thank God for what he's going to do with this check as you all have prayed, as you all have sent, as you have given. And Sunday morning, you'll hear about how you can go when Carrie comes back to speak to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord of the harvest. And Lord, you have uh, told us that we are called to be your witnesses in our Jerusalem, and our Judea, and our Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. And Lord, we thank you that um, your word does not return void. And we thank you that you are the God of salvation, and your, your word works. And so we thank you that you've provided, Lord, uh, through this church, and you have uh, kept us by the power of your gospel and through your word. And Lord, as this money is given, it's yours. I pray that you would use it, Lord, that there would be people in heaven because of this church giving and what you're going to do with it, and Lord, how your word works. It's all yours, Lord. You are the Lord of salvation, and so we give you glory and thanks and praise for all of your goodness. May you be honored. May you use this for your glory, for you are worthy. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
In a desert land, occupied by a hostile army. Dahlia said, they are saying this happened to us because we follow the Messiah. They say we have deserted the ways of our fathers. A community. A family. Struggling to live. You did well to send for me. She's burning up. Jerusalem must be freed from her oppressors. Struggling to love. He said that we should love our enemies. That's what makes us different. Struggling to believe. God feels so far away, Auntie Rivka. I don't even know how to pray anymore. Sometimes we have to go through pain so that we will not be left broken, so we can truly be healed. In the face of all that life brings, Rivka. That's Rivka. Thank you, guys. What what an incredible gift, Portia, uh, Pastor Matt, Cross Point, all of you guys coming out on a on a Friday evening. Uh, before we have Ed close us out here, just a few housekeeping notes. We have uh, just as a small gift to you guys for coming out. We have two things for you. Each family unit, who doesn't like to be referred to as a family unit, uh, will get a. Uh, there's DVDs in the back that it's it includes Magdalena. The Life of Jesus and the Story of Jesus for Children, uh, all back there in eight different languages, all on one DVD, and uh, a book that Dr. Eric Schenkel wrote, and that is uh, some of the stories I believe that were told tonight are in there. Really great. Again, uh, one each of these per one family unit. Make sense? Okay. And then, really importantly too, we just love feedback on nights like this. And there's comment cards and uh, things like that around your seat. And, oh, nope, they're being dished out now. I'm sorry, I was confused. So they're gonna be handed out to you, and uh, as you guys exit, if, if you would be so kind to uh, drop those off on your way out, that helps us know to make these events better and better and better as we continue to uh, continue to spread the word and what God's doing around the world. Sound good? All right, thank you guys again, Ed and team. Praise God for people with courage and passion for other people. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that we would have that same passion and that you would give us courage and that you would give us love for others instead of ourselves and see their need. Please use us how you will. We love you for, for dying for us, but we also know that you died for others. Use us as you will. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Would you stand and join me on this song?
Go and spread his word. You're dismissed.